welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show Season 2. You're all familiar, our emphasis in Season 2 is cash flow and we obviously have to bring really, really, really qualified guests for that. And we did that, a super experienced guy. Our guest today is Curtis May. Hey, Curtis, nice to have you. Hey, how are you? Glad to be here. Yeah, awesome. Thanks that we could figure it out. So before we dive into what you specifically can help our audience learn about cash flow, tell us a little bit how, and I know from our pre, from that 19, 20 years on, how did you get to where you are now? So I started in college. I always tell people I realized the NBA was not looking for 5'11 shooting guards. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, oh, this dream is not going to work out. I need a new plan. And somebody introduced me to financial services as a part-time thing and showed me a check for $400. This one I made for hours worth of work. So I was, for the next 15 years, I was like Dave Ramsey on steroids. I was the, uh, you know, buy term investor difference, max out your 401k. I was securities licensed and I was teaching people how to use mutual, all that stuff, all that, what I call typical financial advice stuff. And then I read a little purple book in 1999, 2000 called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then a, all of a sudden it was a different philosophy that actually resonated with me more the more I got into it. And then, you know, my family had always been self-employed. So it was like, okay, he's talking about cash flow. He's talking about, you know, rich people think differently. They take control of their money. And I was like, you know, you start studying other things is like, okay, there's a two schools of economic thought here. And then the second school resonated with me of what I call corporate finance. And then that would, you know, so my belief now is that typical financial advice doesn't work because if it was a science, nobody would ever lose money. Typical financial advice is so, you know, and this has been over the last 10 years. Like I didn't start out understanding that this was an evolution of just Curtis educating himself to whereas, you know, I developed certain principles that even just from stuff like the richest man in Babylon, you know, you start to understand that. And if you start applying that and get outside the products and the propaganda that the powers that be want to tell you and figure out what's true. What do people that aspire to what I call work optional lifestyle, which is what your listeners want and what the people that call me espouse to, how do you do that? For the last 10 years, I have been evolving and learning how to really hone in on that message. So I started that. So whereas uh, I really focus on what we call principles-based planning. And that's the focus of our firm where our framework is principles drive strategy and strategy drives tactics. Tactics are what you do, the products that you buy, and the products are last. See, most people think the key to growing their money is investing, to finding better investors that pay a higher rate of return. But what I focus on is efficiency, right? So I literally take the complete opposite. Most people transfer their wealth. Transfer meaning it leaves your asset column and goes to somebody else's. Okay. And so most people are involved in that over their lifetime and they're really transferring away two to $5 million per life, per household in their life of money they're giving away. And so what I do is instead of focusing on winning investments, I focus on let's, you know, if I could put a check of $2 million in your account, would that be a conversation that you want to have? If I could get it all back and put it in there, I go, yeah. So people don't know if I can do it or not, but I guarantee they're rooting for me to see if I can find that money. And so that's kind of, that's a long mouthful I just said there, but that's kind of the how I've grown from just a typical, you know, here, do this, buy term investor difference, max out your 401k to kind of what I teach now. Yeah, that's very cool. And I mean, what stuck in that explanation that you just gave in my mind was the term efficiency. So can you give a few examples where you kind of compare and contrast what you would say is efficient versus not efficient? Yeah. So most people believe that the key to growing their money is to take risk, right? No guts, no glory. And they're always looking for better products that pay a higher rate of return. But risk is probability of loss. It's not opportunity for gain, right? So what happens is I look at six things, really. When I when somebody's work with me, I look at one, most wealth is lost by how people manage cash flow or don't manage cash flow, right? And they're budgeting or in business, they're looking at their profit and loss, but that's looking at history, right? You're looking at, that's like driving a car, looking through the rear view mirror, right? And I want you, I teach people to look through the windshield. So you want to give your dollar a job and assign it, right? And so then we look at, so first is managing cash flow. Then we look for the wealth eroders or the wealth transfers. There's like 20, but I'm just going to give you all the top five, right? So after cash flow management, then it's how you pay a mortgage, like 15-year mortgages, sending extra payments, all that stuff. 
this is going to step on some toes is a complete waste of money. All right. Because getting out, paying off your debt earlier does not make you richer just because you're saving money interest. Saving money interest doesn't make you money. It just you're transferring again your capital to the bank. Right. Is what's really going on. Right. And so Kiyosaki has a saying, mind your own business. Well, your business is your asset column. So you need to get in there and leave it in there. The second transfer is taxes. Okay. So let's say you're W-2. Well, one thing, first things I look for if I work with somebody, what did you get a tax refund last year? Oh yeah, I got $5,000. Okay. That means your W-4 is filled out wrong because you're giving Uncle Sam a interest-free loan for five grand and that's money you're not saving. Right. And right. so you need to get with that and understand taxes are your number one expense. Right. And so everything when you look at rich people is to mitigate current and future taxation. So I'm going to do a show after tax season so I can get a, a person. We're going to review yeah. how a tax return works, what you're looking at. Because they don't teach that because if you understood it, you'd be kind of annoyed, right? <laughs> so that's two, right? The third is how people fund qualified plans. Whereas everybody, Wall Street, the banks, the, they all love qualified plans. But if you really understood that they really just do, they defer taxes, and they deferred a calculation of those taxes. And if you really understood that, you might look at how you fund those differently. So that's a big wealth transfer. I'd go into these a little bit deeper. Before you move to the fourth one, the one thing I want to interject here very quick is, I think it's not just deferring taxes. It's also using something, and you and I are so well aligned, I have to mm -hmm. point this out, right? Like there's this saying, I'm pretty sure you would agree, hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. Yes, and, that's uh, one of my favorite things. <laughs> but if you think about it, what you just said with the tax deferment in the qualified plans, in a sense, in the biggest sense, I believe people are not made aware that they are using hope in this context because they hope that the tax system will be equal or better to their advantage by the time these qualified plans actually mature. Mm -hmm. to me, this is the typical thing for hope is not a strategy, because when you look at where we are, I've been pointing this out over and over, the national debt is rising crazy levels. And even if we're never going to pay it back, we will have to at least pay interest on it, mm -hmm. which means it will be harder and harder to fund these different things. All these programs, right. Because you got to ask yourself, will you think in the future, will the government need more money or less? Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And they can so control the tax lever of the money coming out of qualified plans, right? So here's a better word for defer, postpone. And hope. Postpone. And hope, right? So you're postponing <laughs> the taxes and you're hoping that, you know, because people have this assumption and this is what like accountants and other people is they assume, oh, you'll be in a lower tax bracket. Well, that means you're poorer because you don't go down because you're 65, right? So you're hoping you don't know what you're, I mean, you could argue we're a historically low tax bracket now, right? Now here's the other thing. Now you got me going. So <laughs> the average, so 90% of households in a country in the U.S. make $120,000 a year or less, okay? So let's say you make 100000 so if people don't understand the difference between is effective tax rate and because we have a progressive tax system, right? right, right. So yeah, the yeah. first zero to 10 or 12,000, you don't pay zero and then it goes up to 12, you know, so there's the average actual tax rate versus the effective rate. So if you make a hundred grand, your effective tax rate is like 8.8%, .8%, right? So it ain't going to get no lower than that. And so now you're putting in $10,000 in your qualified plans, you're saving $800, postponing it for the privilege to pay 20 or 30% on it when you pull it back out. See, nobody knows that. Yeah. It's yeah, not. No, you're like absolutely right. And I mean, if I put the cherry on the icing of that cake, mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. of our cakes is, in my opinion, is if you were not to give it into a qualified plan, but find something alternatively that performs consistently better than what typically is in the qualified plan, especially when you give it the same time horizon, which is for me always, people say, oh yeah, my qualified plan is investing in mutual funds. And why do you do this? Well, because they have this potential hope of lower risk there, over time. Yeah, I'm right. saying, okay, I can show you bunches of investments, especially since that idea was grow up, we focus mainly on residential real estate, where if you're willing to say, okay, I have 20, 25, 30 years ahead of me, they always outperform you. There is not even a contest especially because they have so many other things than just sheer appreciation. But my point is the money, those $800 that you're basically deferring, if you can compensate that through efficiency or performance, that money right now is way more worth those $800 than 
later on when you actually have to basically pay way more that's also for me always the agree that yeah because of inflation your money yeah, will exactly. never be worth more than it is today yeah exactly exactly right and the institutions know that so why do they you know make it seem like they're doing you a favor by locking they would never lock their money up for 30 years with no control over it well i mean they're kind of willing to do it and i really think you made a brilliant point when you said you know with the mortgage was, i think that was your number one thing is if you really think about it you have a 30-year mortgage that you did two years ago at let's say 2.98 percent you would be an idiot to give that money back any sooner than you absolutely have to because yes. the longer you can wait the less valuable that money is going to be so i but i interjected too much go to number no i mean that's because that's just see i like discussions right i like to go yeah. back and forth that's fun and so because we believe the same thing it's like yes you know can you make more than two percent or five percent and if you have nothing better to do with it and you're i won't say a moron but if you have nothing better to do with it then go ahead and by all means pay the mortgage off okay so paying a mortgage off early is not bad as one mentor would say it just ain't good okay. yeah but i mean today especially today when we take that comparison between somebody got a mortgage anytime longer than 15 months ago you yeah. can even get treasury bills that perform better than your mortgage rate. yes I yeah mean, and it's, it's, it's so much stuff this is where economics is major right so we you know we're not to nerd all on that but you know we're in a as we record this we're in an inverted year code so short time right. rates are higher than long-term rates right right and see so there are ways to lock some of that stuff in you know outside of banking stuff because when the fed reached the point where they drop it those high cds or some of that stuff is going to go back down so what if you could put it in this goes into tactics products which are the last thing that we talk about principal strategy tactics but there's ways to lock some of that stuff in long range but you got to understand the game you're playing right yeah and i think one of the things that is in the bigger scheme of things in the bigger picture i have to almost assume deliberately neglected both in the media and whoever else the so-called experts are that are being pulled out for cnbc and in any of these financial shows and that is they're always talking in a positive sense about the performance of an investment, whether it's stocks or whatever other type of investment you do. But they don't ever look, at least in my experience, at the other side. Right? When you look at the little bit longer time period, let's say the last 15 years, being able, just living in that time at an age and at an income level where you can say, okay, I was able, like in my case, a lot of the properties we bought, we bought in 2017, 18, 19, early mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the pandemic. And we were able, even for investment properties, to get below 4%. And on our own residence, we got below 3%. And I'm absolutely sure in maybe five years from now or so, maybe even a little earlier, people will say, Curtis, Axel, and people like us, you guys were so lucky you got mortgage rates for 3%, right? Same, and nobody talks about it, but everybody talked about how real estate investors were so lucky when they got their hands on real estate in 2009, 10, 11, when everything was in foreclosure, you could get it for 40 cents on the dollar, right? So I think this realization, how we can actually during certain periods of time do certain investments in a certain way to really understand the whole picture. I don't know if it's ever going to go below 3% for 30 year mortgages, but at least that was the lowest it's ever been. When Listen, when I came out of high school, do you understand mortgage rates were like 16%? Yeah, I know. You're right. The money market accounts were paying 22%. A new, so interest is relative, right? But guess what? If you buy it and it's high, when it goes back down, because it goes in markets, then you refinance, right? And get a lower and lock in a lower rate. So, I mean, you just, because see, here's the thing. Let's go back to what is investing. Let me give you yeah. the, the okay. lot of four. Before you go, I just want to say for, our, we have a few people that listen to this internationally. What Curtis is about to say about the refi stuff and so forth is only, the only country I know where that works is in the United States. No okay. It's in the world they allow you to do this so just a little they're crazy enough to allow you to lock in money at a fixed rate for 30 years right so the, no, the no, government that, backs that, it here you can get that well you can get 30 year mortgages other places too but the longest i have found internationally that they fix the rate is 10 years wow like right. you were just saying you know i can get right now and we're doing investments even right now even in real estate 
where we have 7.8 or 8% re- interest. Mm-hmm. We locked that in initially for 30 years because it's still the cheapest we can do right now. And we basically have a strategy where we say when it comes back down, let's say to 4%, then we refi. But the fact mm-hmm. that at any time you find another bank who gives you cheaper money and you can refi, that only works in the United States. And I want to... Oh, interesting. Okay. That's, I didn't you know have, that. When you sign for 10 years, you have to make the 10 years at the rate you sign or you pay a penalty... And you can never sign the whole term. Mm. So I mean, if I was a bank, that's what I would do. I'm not taking yeah, all that risk. Yeah, that's why we are, right. you know, yeah. but we're both. got to look at both it, sides it, of it. Like, it's yeah, a business. Yeah. No, right? absolutely. As educators, we're both educators. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I'm always saying sometimes I like to point these things out because we're, especially in negative uh, mindset kind of times, like some of we have right now, these things, these advantages that we have pretty much as the only ones in the world that I have found so far should be pointed out. Right, yeah. that we have this flexibility. You can lock it for the whole term, and if you find a better deal, you can immediately pay it back and lock it for a lower term. Nowhere else in the world can you do this without penalty. Well, I would. So that's when I go back to principles, right? So, so the, let me tell you the the efficiency. I'll give you two more examples. How people pay their more. This is U.S. based. So now you yeah, yeah, I, now I clarify. Right? How people pay their mortgages, <laughs> funding five twenty nine plans, that type of stuff, and then how they pay for. Now this is universal. I think how you pay for major capital purchases. Okay, which is defined as anything you can't pay for in full within monthly cash flow, right? right and right. so we teach people never we call drain the tank for never liquidate a future asset for a current lifestyle event. Right. Okay, right. and so we teach a collateralization strategy using life insurance, where our clients will collateralize that money as opposed to like a tax bill. Let's get a ten thousand dollar tax bill. I would not take cash my cash to pay uncle sam that's a wealth transfer i would collateralize my insurance asset which i do right and i borrow against that leaving my money still making money i pay them and then i recapture my money and pay myself back so i try to keep all the ones here's my asset column curtis doesn't want to ever let it leave okay no, absolutely and i think we're totally aligned on that so i think we touched on a few things so that yeah. we have a pretty good idea how you're thinking how well you and i are thinking and like right, right, right. you know kind of listen fun. to this man he's brilliant yeah, yeah, yeah. no this he, is cool. you. Um, <laughs> so since you are a financial planner who helps people achieve their goals and the overarching theme of this season that we're in is cash flow. If somebody who is listening to us says, okay, I really like the style that Curtis has, the way he looks at things, explains things, I would like to know how can I actually optimize and increase my cash flow. And I think it would be nice if you would first clarify, I, I want to tell you mine, and then you can use yours. For us, for me, for our clients, when we speak about cash flow, it's basically the money that is left over after all the expenses to an investment have been paid. So just in a nutshell, if I buy a house, I put a 30 year mortgage on it, I pay $500 for the mortgage, $100 for the insurance, maybe $100 for property tax and $100 for property management. And my rent is, let's say, $1,200. So I have $500 left or $400 left. And that left over after paying all expenses would be the cash flow, right? So I, you might use slightly different calculation. But if somebody said, okay, I want to optimize that, I want to get as much of that dependently coming to me, how would you advise them? Okay, so that's, yeah, I have the same thing. You know, I use the Jim Rohn definition, being able to live like you want to live from the income from your personally invested assets. Yeah, exactly. Not working, yeah. right? Yeah. So we call it financial free. So I don't, we don't talk about retirement, but I think we're saying the same thing. I could see you want f- to be financially free, right? Which is passive income greater than your expenses, which is a capability, meaning you have assets. And so now what I talk about are there's four asset classes. So I'm actually asset class agnostic, okay? If there's business, there's real estate. So, you know, if you can develop passive income for within your business, meaning you don't, you're not involved in your businesses during money. Right. Um, so in our process, in our planning process, we delineate between that. We focus on getting out the rat race because see, typical advice is not designed for you to become financially free. It's designed to develop assets under management for the institution. But that's not, see, I define success as helping my clients become rich, helping my clients 
have the capability of financial freedom. So now you have to focus on that because that won't happen ordinarily. So what we do is we, one, help people find money they're losing unknown unnecessarily so that you can save. Because see, what I teach you the five principles. So the five principles to help our clients become and remain financially free. That's the objective. So let's start with that. So principle one, you got to save. Save what? 15, 20% or more of your gross income, right? Now, let me define savings. 401k doesn't count, right? If you're in the US, that's not savings because it has risk. It goes up and down. So savings, safe, liquid, accessible, guaranteed. Okay. So there's only a few things that you can store capital in that does that. But the habit I'm concerned with is savings. We literally say, look, I want you to look at your pay or look at your profits. And I want you to look and save or after like, so let's say for example, after you get the property and after you pay the mortgage, that's your profit, right? So you can save all of that, or at least 15 to 20% of that goes into, we call it a wealth coordination or wealth capture account. And I want you to literally, cause see savings has to be automatic and systematic, right? right. That's the start of velocity. What we teach is velocity of money over investing for capital gain. And so the second principle is protection. See, most people skip this step. They want to jump right to an investing. See, the financial plan precedes the investment plan or the business plan. So you have to play defense. So Curtis is the defensive coordinator, right? Because see, let me go back to what investment. Investing is not about buying something. It's about becoming something, right? So you have to become a good business owner. You have to become a good real estate investor. So you got to learn how to do it. So your first investment is in between your two ears, right? Your mindset, your skill set, your network. You have to become, there's the other asset class is paper. So paper is not just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. It's notes. It could be tax lien certificates. It yep. could be private lending. It could be life settlements. There's all kinds of stuff outside of you know bonds and stocks and ETFs. I mean, there's other stuff. So you have to educate yourself and you have to figure out. And I, I try to tell people what to invest in because it's not my job to tell you what to become, right? You got to find out what you like. I, I like business. That's my my favorite because I can make business is it for me because I grew up my family was self employed is the fastest path to cash. Like I think in turn I could I'd rather find something, sell something, create something, sell it. Boom! Now I take the profits. And the profits go into real estate so I can generate passive income, right. minimize my tax. You know, so there's a, there's a formula because yeah? it's, it's just a formula. What is your formula? Right. And the fourth asset class is commodities, but oil and gas, gold and silver. But I don't view gold and silver as investing. I view it as money. Like I view it as insurance, really. So I don't. I actually, my recommendation for our investors or for our people that come to us for similar reasons is to have about 10%, but not in what I call vapor gold or vapor silver, but in actual gold and silver coins. Yeah. And Kind of for two reasons. Obviously, there's one main reason is universality. And what I mean by that is nowhere has there ever been a time where you couldn't go with a silver coin to any bank anywhere in the world if they are operating. You can understand the difference between currency and money, right? And fiat currency, money by government decree, or these silver coins or an ounce of gold that buys today what it bought 2,000 years ago. So it's really a store of value. Right. Yeah, exactly. But my point is more if you happen to go somewhere, right? Like, I mean, I'm always saying the proverbial shit hits the fan, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to have a plan B, some location that you have maybe gone on vacation or staked out, or you maybe even bought something uh, where you think if it really gets bad, I that's where I want to go. Here. But it's not yeah. very likely that under those circumstances, especially when it's economically driven, that you're going to come with a big stash of dollar notes. Right. But you also don't have to be too worried if you have like a couple of silver coins and a couple of gold coins and this whole argument, they're not transportable. I mean, you can have easily a hundred thousand dollars in gold coins and you put them in your wallet, right? I mean, it's not that much weight or anything like that. So it's, you can use yeah, it anywhere yeah, yeah. in the world. Or but, have it where you want to go already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but, but the yeah. other the other part that is maybe a little underestimated, rarely ever spoken about is that there are things just in general that have limited quantities and their value is not purely the value of the material, but it also has, in a sense, a collector's value. Yeah. Right. So if I just get a little gold bar, like, you know, from the US Mint or something like that, then what I get is basically the current value, whatever it trades for $2,000 an ounce. Right. Something like that. If, on the other hand, I get basically a one ninety nine point nine nine percent pure gold piece of art, right. it 
form of a coin. Right. There's in in the vast vast majority, and it's kind of similar to a painting or stuff, or like yeah. a bottle of wine or bottle of whiskey or stuff. There is only this one time when these are being created, and there are people out there who say, you know, I want the Mona Lisa or gold coins, and I'm right. willing to give more than just the pure per ounce value. So it's one thing the universality that you have with it, but the other thing is also the the possibility. That you end up having something that anybody is willing to give you more for than just the pure value of of the metal, right? So yeah. that's and then it goes back to becoming, right? So you'd have to know that, and that's why you got to you know learn about how stuff works. And and because what we do is we abdicate. Go, going back to hope is not a strategy. We we the, basically the school the powers that be teach. You know you don't have time to temper the training to manage your stuff. So basically give your money to us, right? And so what you have to do, what I want people to do, is to focus on cash flow. So you literally need to look and say, all right, listen, I'm saving. I've protected. So I've got proper insurances, asset protection, umbrella coverage, you know, because you could, there's we, life, you're going to have one of three problems. You're going to live too long. You're going to die too soon. You're going to get sick. So you have to, <laughs> before you even get into all the other stuff, you have to play defense. You have to protect yourself yep. from all kinds of eventualities. You, I want, my third principle is full replacement of assets at death, guaranteed. Uh, the fourth principle is six to 12 months of cash, of li of your income, mm -hmm. liquid. Now, not in cash, like sitting around or just sitting in a bank. I mean, I, I show people different locations uh, of where to store. Like, at, like in the U.S., we teach how to use properly structured uh, permanent or dividend paying whole life as our storage facility. And then now I can have it, but I can collateralize. So I don't have to liquidate to use. All right. So now I get the benefit of tax free growth, uninterrupted compounding. Then the fifth principle, getting to your point of financial freedom, is velocity, right? So we call the velocity method where we focus on velocity of money. So move, you know, the economic principle of velocity as opposed to buying and holding and giving control of the money so that the institutions can use velocity, right? And so you have to velocity, leverage, right? And uh, cash flow. Those are the things. So what you're doing, so now, now you got to have a goal of cash flow. So, and then what is the asset class? So the, so I, and I think you should, you know, I set like three-year goals. <clears throat> so our goal is financial freedom in a decade or less, right? And so, but you work backwards. So it's like, okay, is it, is it real estate? Well, okay. Then how many properties are you going to buy this year? Right. How many offers do you, you know, you have to break it down. So you don't right. focus on the thing. You have to focus on the work, you know, that it takes to do that. But now you're measuring, okay, well, this quarter I've got to make five offers and I need to get this and I want to grow my cash flow by $800 a month or whatever, $500 a month. And then, so can you buy a house a year for the next 10 years or two houses a year or, um, or apartment building a year for, and so you focus on that. And then I teach a strategy. I'm going to do a show on this week on the, the, uh, studying Buffett, right? The magic of compounding assets. So he took Berkshire, right? And then when he took it out of textiles and then then he bought other assets with that. You know, right. he, he bought Geico, and then he, you know, he bought shares of Coca Cola last year. I think uh, was it was last year before last. Coca Cola stock paid him seven hundred and fifty million dollars in dividends. Yeah, you know, same thing with uh, American Express, right? And so, but he's bought. He let his main asset that generates revenue buy other assets. So people talk about compound interest. How let's get the because you know stocks don't compound. Stocks go up, they go down. They appreciate. That is news to a lot of registered reps. Like they don't earn compound interest, right? Because they reflect it as a rate of return. But see, we're going back to hope it's not a strategy. If you have 100000 and the money drops by, you know, let's say 50% for easy math, you have to earn 100% on that portfolio to get back to where you were. That's not, you know, so when you see these numbers, they're very disingenuous, you know, in terms yeah, of- and, and I think that I, I totally agree with you, Curtis. And and we can actually use a, a real example. I mean, if you just look at 2022, we're all now in 2023, especially tech as, uh, assets or stocks that mm -hmm. a lot of people were very much into together in a basket lost about 30% on average. Mm -hmm. right? But that means, okay, so if I had on average the stock price of $100 and it went down to $70 now, so how much percentage-wise does it have to go up to just get back to $100 from 70 right? That's almost 50% that it has to go up 45% or so, not 30 
And right. that, those kind of things, it's the same thing I've been struggling trying to help people to understand the difference between linear, linear growth and exponential growth, right? Because when we're going back to our topic of cash flow, you said, okay, in a linear world, in a linear mindset, you might say, okay, if I say I want $4,000 as my current life money that I need to, to have the freedom, and I make $400 per house and I need 10 houses. Right. right. That would be linear thinking. The reality is that would mean you would never raise the rent. Mm, right. Which is obviously stupid if you say right. that it's my 10 year plan. I buy a house every year in a linear way, one house per year for 10 years, then I have my $4,000. But the reality is, latest after two years, you're going to increase the rent. Right. In addition to and that. Hey, so inflation helps you, right? Because well, not just it inflation. drives the property up. Well, inflation cost of living goes up. So you have to raise the rent. Yeah, exactly. Or you can raise then, rent. Since I, I was just triggered by because you talked about compounding assets. Right? Yeah. So let's just say, okay, I do this for three or four years. And in the first few years, I, I just have enough to buy one house a year. So now I have four. But in those four years, these houses have also appreciated, even if they're not home runs, right. but they appreciate a little bit. So now I can go and say, okay, I get a line of credit on the appreciation. And now I can, in the next year, five, I can buy two uh, because yeah. my velocity of money. And your sorry. knowledge is going up. Yeah. And so now you know how to do it more efficiently, you know, more efficiently. And so you got to take that in because now you've learned, hopefully you're learning your study, you're learning new strategy, you learn how to raise capital, you're learning other stuff. So because see the three rules of investing that we teach, so we, so we actually do a one page game plan. So when you're talking about what do we do, I teach a one game plan. I, I give people like uh, we analyze your stuff. We break it into the principles. We look for efficiency, right? And that teach so the five principles, and that teach the three rules of investing, right? Invest in what you know, right? Or invest in knowing, okay? If you, you know, uh, invest in what you can. This is huge. Invest in what you can control or what you can influence the outcome of. See, right. that's investing, right? Um, and then don't chase returns. And most people are chasing returns. So if you you have to see, because you have to want to be in control. It's like the people that are attracted to me are people that their goal is work, optional lifestyle, but they already know because I get a, I, I get a, a lot of people attracted to me are real estate investors, small business owners, or people that aspire to that. So those are the people that understand that they can, or the beginning to understand they can make their money, their assets make more money than Vanguard. Okay. And so they want more liquidity use control of their capital so they can do more of what they know how to do. A lot of times I give them permission because they believe that, but the world and the not the, they're all great companies. The Edward Jones is in the Sachs. They're all they their goal is asset sort of management. So they're all you're getting. So all going back to your original thing, the narrative on TV is stocks are great. And so people think the Dow and is in and the stock market is the economy. It's not. It's just an asset class. But you know, so you don't. Yeah, do I mean, for now, me, I, you know, I, it is an asset class. For me, it's also a casino where you know. And, and I'm saying this fully, meaning the reason behind it. Because anybody who has ever known or heard anything about casinos knows that in the long run, the bank always wins. The house always wins. Yeah, it is and, a casino. And, we and call the, it the big casino. I call it the big... One of the guys I interviewed on my show, a friend of mine now, the Pirates in Manhattan, Barry Van Dyke. And he's got a, a show. He's got a, a, three great books out. But the first one's called The Pirates in Manhattan. He calls it the big casino. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what they teach you to do and what they do actually do with their money, it's literally 180 degrees difference. Complete opposite. But what people don't understand, you can do that. And this is kind of what I, I'm trying to teach people. You can do what they do. Like, you don't have to do what they tell you to do. Let's look at them. And and because you can borrow their business model, their methodology, and those strategies work in personal finance. Yeah, That's I'm totally does. with you. I mean, the, the yeah. difference is you cannot, if you want to invest in the NASDAQ or in the S&P or in the Dow, you cannot really directly influence these companies. Yes, you might have a vote when they have their shareholder meeting, but that's about it, but not really. Yeah. Versus all the other things we discussed today, you can really take a ownership in a sense. Yeah. And, and that ownership allows you to have control. And I think that's the huge difference. Yeah, if you control how you buy stuff, you can control yeah, yeah. refinancing. If I put a dollar in my business and invest in marketing and make $2, that's 100% return. So yeah, yeah, I'd rather absolutely. do that. You yeah, know. yeah, totally, totally. So yeah, I think we really covered this very well. And, and I think the audience got a pretty good idea why it's probably advisable, like I always keep saying, is 
turn that off and really educate you know invest in in knowing stuff turn the news off can, <laughs> yeah yeah exactly turn the news off invest in knowing so that you can then invest in assets now at the end of the show which we're getting rapidly towards uh curtis we always ask two questions that are not really directly related to the topic and the first one is if you could meet anybody past or present who would it be and why one of the guys one of my, my favorite entrepreneur is ab fuller Okay, who's little known. He's like my entrepreneur hero. He's from Chicago. He was like a multimillionaire black entrepreneur during segregation from Chicago. And he built, uh, he was written about in Dennis Kimbrough's book, Success Secrets of Black Millionaires. And he's the kind of the model I follow where he basically taught sales and empowerment and entrepreneurship as the key for what ails the African-American community. And he was ostracized by the powers that be that wanted to go march around for civil rights, <laughs> and yeah. uh, which is important. But I'm saying is I want control. Like my, my dad's favorite song was a James Brown song. It was called, I don't want nobody to give me nothing, open up the door, get it myself. Right. And so he was very much, you know, young entrepreneur trying to control. So I, I just, I model a lot of his thought process and I wish I could, you know, spend a lunch or afternoon with him through the fifties. And, and uh, he used to teach a class every Saturday called the gospel of success. You know, one of the people that was in that class, Mary Kay Ash, he said, see that white girl up there? Well, she's great. I'll earn all of y'all because he was giving away Cadillacs to this sales team yeah, I know, in the fifties. Yeah. And, and she was in that and boom, that's where all this stuff comes from. So that's that's one of my favorite people. That's a long answer, but that's that's no, that's very cool. And I always <laughs> appreciate when there's a little bit of an explanation with it. And then the final question is if you had a time machine, you could go forward, backward, in good Star Trek fashion. You can't change the time space continuum, but you know. Okay. You yes. So where would you go and why? Never thought about that. Let's see. I like it here. <laughs> so <laughs> and uh I like where we are right now. The seventies was simple, like with Brady Bunch and you yeah. know, and um, but I actually I think we're in the best time to be alive. It's it's scary, but it's exciting. So I don't know that I would like to go, go observe some great minds, like back to the first one, but I don't think I would, you know, two hundred years ago it wasn't all that great for <laughs> for people like me. So I don't want to go back too far. I, I would love to maybe observe uh we went to Royal Italy in November. So I'm you know, people think like two thousand years ago was this backward times and they had running water, you know. Yeah. And, and so I'd be beautiful baths. I did you go to Pompeii? Yes. Yeah. So I yes. mean if you look at what they had in house, you know, at that time, it's pretty my cool. wife was shocked. She hadn't heard the Pompeii story of like the whole thing. I was like, You haven't heard this before? And I was like, No, these guys were I mean, you think about it, there was 5,000 years of recorded history. So, I mean, you were only in 2023. So, you think about 5,000 years to well, learn something. More than that, I mean, the pharaohs were like 6,000 before Christ. So, it's probably more like eight or 9,000 or stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's been a lot of, of history and a lot of it we're denying. But no, that's that's very cool. I, I, I would love to see that. That, that yeah, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I've, I'm <laughs> asking this question all the time. And, and I'm still mainly interested if we get that city on Mars. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want to go like to 2060 or so and see if it actually came in reality you know mm. I don't know. I'm scary for all of the, the, the I, I think there's a lot of bad ideology out there about economics, about all these experiments, modern monetary theory. So yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm with you on that. But see, even though I said earlier, hope is not a strategy, but there is something to be said for the hope of a new beginning. Right. And I think it sounds maybe a little highly overly philosophical, but I think not the technology, even though that would be probably super cool too, but the opportunity to say, take everything that we know, technology, political, law, all that kind of things, human nature, psychology, and here is another ball, just happens to be red instead of blue. And you can start over and apply this and see if you can come up with a better solution. I think that is just a fascinating thing. That's why you know I would want to go and see. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Stealthily in our show, I'm trying to get people to understand like like nothing is, is new under the sun. Right. And so if you can understand human nature, have a good moral base and understand economics instead of all this nonsense out there, then my hope is so what I'm trying to do is get people to think. So I'll have people read stuff like economics in one lesson or the law by Friedrich Basiat, because I'm trying to like, OK, here, this stuff has been tried before and you need to like understand the fundamentals and then I'll build the financial stuff because I want to build it on principles. Principles are unchanging. 
So people say, oh, you don't understand it's new now, there's Bitcoin. No, principles don't change, right? You know, so if you read The Rich Man in Babylon, it's seven cures for a lean purse. Well, those are principles, right? Part, you know, and part of all your insurance is key. Budget back expenses, make your gold multiply. That's make money, manage cash flow, create velocity. So that doesn't change. And so if you, if we can get people and young people to understand that and stop putting so much trust in these institutions whose objective is not to make you rich, is to make money off of you. And I think that if you can get that and then you focus on what you can control, your personal economy and your production and consumption as a family, and then focusing on every year I'm growing my cash flow. Every year yeah, I'm moving absolutely. I, I'm financial. with you on that. And I think, you know, what we're both trying to accomplish is for people to become aware of these principles that are yes. out there yeah. and then pick out of because there are way too many that somebody could say i do them all but you want to pick the ones that you then confidently and believably can claim to be your principles and that you use to operate under and that also then really answers 99 percent of 100 questions is you know what your principles are so you know how to act almost right. always right so with that being said i think that's a good capstone for our conversation so if people say hey I really love this Curtis guy. How can they get in touch with you? Well, I'll give you a couple of ways. So listen to the show, go to the Practical Wealth Show, and you can listen to more or the on YouTube, search for the Practical Wealth Show, and you can find more of the, what I call the madness that is Curtis, <laughs> 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 the contrarian, right? And then I would go to our, our check out our website, Practical Wealth, www.practicalwealthsolutions.net. That will take you to all my stuff. And then if you like, you want to, I have a report we give out called Creating Wealth with the Velocity of Money. So if, if y'all will text be the bank, all one word, all caps to five, five, four, 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 we'll send that out to you. You can begin the reading. I, you'll find very much a financial educator. So on, through the show, I'm trying to educate you because if you don't like, if you don't want to think and you don't want to be in control of your money, I'm probably not a good person to call. <laughs> so. no, that's absolutely. And I think that's, that's really important. You can't help everybody. You can only help the people that are open for help. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, Curtis. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we went a little over, but it was a really lively conversation. So I'm glad that we could have it and maybe we can do it again. Anytime, anytime. So thank you for having me on. Guys, go out there and um, make it a prosperous day. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes, or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.